Good morning, and welcome to Sydenham Street United Church in Kingston, Ontario. We are coming to you virtually, and will continue virtually for the next few weeks until we deem it safe to open up our doors again. This is the last Sunday in the series of Insights for Epiphany. Today's topic is Start Where You Are At. Valerie Reloshin, my youngest daughter, will be speaking to us. Valerie is an environmental engineer and a project manager in the water and wastewater area. She is married to Jack Obacco, a black man from Cameroon who came to Canada 30 years ago. He has been teaching in the Toronto schools ever since. He is a musician, a storyteller, and a marvelous instrumentalist. After the service at one o'clock, there will be a time for conversation and Valerie will attend. Next week and for the period of Lent and up to and including Easter Sunday, the Reverend Joe Ramsey will lead our services. We are most appreciative that he has agreed to come and lead us in worship. Joe has asked that on Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock, we meet via, via Zoom for a short Bible study. Uh, and the topic will be Mark 1, 9 to 15, which is our scripture for next Sunday. So please read the scripture and come with your opinions. A new group is forming to look at and read Norm Esden's poetry. Please contact Ian Malcolm if you're interested in joining this. And next Sunday at 1 o'clock, there will be an AGM uh, meeting uh, for everybody to attend. Uh, this will be via Zoom and the coordinates will be in the newsletter. There is a great deal in the newsletter. I encourage you to read it all. Uh, particularly getting the Zoom coordinates right because there are so many meetings. Assisting in today's service uh, are Michael Fenn, uh, who is our organist and soloist, and Lisa Levitt, who puts the service together. We appreciate their support. Please join me in the acknowledgement of the land. Since time immemorial, Indigenous people have occupied and cared for this land. In acknowledging this land, the traditional home of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, we seek to rebuild right relations with First Nation, Métis and Inuit people, and to learn from them and to live on this land with respect and in gratitude for its bounty. I invite you now to light a candle Contemplate the, contemplate the flame, see the various colors in it and how well they blend. As you sit back and relax, please listen to the centering music played by Michael.
please join with me in the call to worship. We come to worship God, seeking wisdom in becoming the image of God. Open our hearts to receive the Spirit. Amen. Please join with me in the gathering prayer. Creator God, God of love, God of all, we come humbly to worship and seek peace. We are worn down by the isolation from COVID-19, overwhelmed by the new awareness of the brokenness of our society and the abject failure of our efforts to have a community safe for everyone. Sometimes it seems that chaos reigns. We seek knowledge and clarity in our search for solutions to the complex issues we face in our society today. We need strength in order to persevere in our efforts to create a more just world where all people are supported and encouraged to reach their potential. We need wisdom to know what we can do and what we should do, and what we should leave for others. More importantly, we must learn how to engage with others who are different, to work together as allies, listening and supporting wherever we are able. Be with us in our struggles. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Touch our hearts that we may know compassion from failing embers build a blazing fire love strong enough to overturn injustice to seek a world more Come touch and bless our hearts. Come touch our souls that we may know and love you. Your quiet presence all our fears dispel. Create a space for spirit. Life and beauty fill us. Come touch and bless our souls. Come touch our minds and teach us how to reason. Set free our thoughts to wonder and to dream. Help us to open doors of understanding to welcome truth and wisdom. Come touch and bless our minds. Come touch us in the moments we are fragile and in our weakness your 
great strength reveal that we may rise to follow and to serve you to steady now our nerve come touch and bless our wills come touch us now this people who are gathered to break the bread and share the cup of peace that we may love you with our heart and soul our mind our strength our all come touch us with your grace. Please join me in a prayer for illumination. We open now to sacred mystery to the Holy One, infinitely greater than words can express, whose love for us and all creation exceeds our capacity to imagine. Amen. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. God did not mean that we all look like God. He meant that we should all try to be like God, to have God-like characteristics, God-like conscience, personality, or will. But human beings, being human and imperfect, do not always reach that far. Too often we attach ourselves to the physical characteristics that are different and make assumptions based on those differences. My personal story happened when I was about four years old. My father and I were walking down a sidewalk. This was memorable for me because my father walked with a limp. He had a brace on one leg and we did not go walking down sidewalks very often. A man came towards us, and when he reached us, he stopped right in front of us and spoke to me and said, what's wrong with him? I looked at my father and he nodded and I looked at the man and I said, nothing's wrong with him. To which the man replied, he walks funny. I said, no, he doesn't. He always walks like that. This man was othering my father. He was assuming that my father was lesser because he was lame. And he was talking to a child instead of addressing the person who had the disability. Of course, at the age of four, I didn't realize all this, but I was struck by the fact that the man, a stranger, was talking to me, the child. Othering refers to the process whereby an individual or groups of people attribute negative characteristics to other individuals or groups of people that set them apart as representing that which is opposite to them. If you named a country, somebody would have an epithet that goes with that ethnicity. If you named a religion, likewise. We assume that people are something because of what little we know about the group that they belong to. Othering is something that everybody does and we have done this since mankind walked the earth. Think about one tribe not trusting or um, 
liking another. Uh, the same thing with a group based on color, based on ethnic origin, the LGBT community, um, disabled people, deaf people, blind people. We do all insult and offend people by making assumptions about their limitations or their characters based on external factors. And we don't always look into people's hearts to find out what they're really like. My second scripture is Luke 6, 31. And Matthew 7, 12 says pretty much the same thing. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. This rule is at the core of every major religion. Maybe worded slightly differently, but it nevertheless means the same thing. Treat people as you want to be treated. It sounds simple. It sounds easy. But I am not sure that it's exactly the correct way to phrase this. And I will ask a question of you to think about, and perhaps we can talk about it this afternoon. If a black family came to Sydenham Street United Church, after COVID is over, of course, I know that the people on the door would welcome them because we are intentionally hospitable in our church. You would ask them to come in, maybe ask where they're from, suggest that maybe their children would like to go to Sunday school and usher them to a seat in the sanctuary. My question to you is, in spite of our intentions to be welcoming, if that black family sat down and looked around the sanctuary and saw that they were the only black family there, would they still feel welcome? Would they feel safe? We have all been horrified at what COVID has revealed about our society and its shortcomings. And in particular, uh, and especially due uh, to the murder of George Floyd in the United States, we have seen that as awful as our societies are to people in general, they are worse to black people. No matter what challenges we face, black people have higher mountains to climb. And I would ask a question of you. What would your life be like if every day when you stepped outside your home, going to work, walking or on the subway or on a bus, working, shopping, going to a theater, what would your life be like if every minute of every day you had to wonder, am I welcome here? Am I safe? If you were in a relationship where one partner beat another, you might have an idea of the stress of not knowing when the next beating was coming. But for black folk, the stress of living, never knowing if they're welcome and if they're safe is lifelong and has come to light through the uh, people on the news, people in positions of authority like professors and doctors and lawyers, politicians, leaders in the community, mayors, journalists, who have been able to articulate their lives and what has struck me is while we are aghast at the harm done to black people in North America and Canada is not exempt, these people aren't 
surprised because they have been living it. Black people in America, even successful black people, suffer every day from the not knowing. And that is where white privilege needs to take action. We need to support black people in their struggles. We need to advocate with them where we can use our white privilege to assist and to break down the barriers that are there that we may not be able to see, but are certainly there for the people, the black people of Canada and the United States. Doing unto other as you would have them do unto you isn't enough. We need to do unto others as they need us to do. And that may take extra effort on our part. Some food for thought. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Before I get into sharing some stories this morning, I need to let you know that when my mom approached me to be part of this service, I hesitated. Cat's got your tongue, eh? My mom said, and we both laughed. But it was true. I didn't have words. I am not an anti-racism expert. In fact, I feel like I still have an enormous amount of learning and unlearning to do to dismantle the internalized white supremacy that all of us have. However, after some reflection and understanding that we were talking under the theme of Insights for Epiphany, I decided that I could share a bit about my ongoing journey of learning how to be anti-racist. There is no one way to start or continue that journey, and I'm only one example. As some of you already know, I grew up in Kingston in the 80s and 90s. Growing up, I had a few racialized students in my classes, but I honestly didn't know why people had different skin colors. It wasn't talked about. I didn't have a vocabulary for it. And as far as I knew, it didn't make a difference. Though I didn't know it at the time, I was learning how to be colorblind. Fast forward a few years to high school, I learned the word racism, knew that being racist was bad, and believed that I was a good person and not racist, so I wasn't part of the problem. At that time, I understood racism to be violence against racialized people, generally by people called skinheads and neo-Nazis. After high school, I went off to study engineering at the University of Guelph. To this day, I am grateful that I connected with two incredible women in my program that first week of school. We supported each other continuously throughout our degree. One of my new friends had slightly darker skin than mine, but sort of looked white, so I just assumed she was white. Or more accurately, I didn't see color, so it didn't matter that her skin, what her skin color was. I was in my third year of university, three years of intense studying and group assignments with my friends, when I met her parents and discovered that her mom was white and her father was Pakistani. If I was an emoticon, it would have been the one with the exploding head. I had never given any thought to her parents. After that time, I had a new understanding of who my friend was, but it still wasn't very deep and we still did not discuss race between ourselves. Towards the end of my degree, I moved to Toronto for a co-op placement. Being from a smaller city, the idea of living in Toronto actually terrified me, but I was really excited about the job opportunity and figured I could leave the city on weekends to seek out calmer and quieter places. But lo and behold, it turned out I really liked the big city. There were so many people, so many things happening, and it felt really easy and safe to get around. Then I fell in love with my now husband, Jacko. It was love at first sight, and we've been together ever since the day we met. A few months into our relationship, I invited Jacko to join me at a jazz festival with a friend from work. I had told my friend about Jacko and that he was going to join us. 
As he was approaching across Nathan Phillips Square, I said, there he is. He's the one in the blue shirt. Now you can imagine in a large crowd, that's not the most helpful description. As he approached, my friend looked at me and said, oh, that's Jacko? You could have just said he was black. I would have spotted him sooner. Which was a very obvious observation, seeing as the crowd assembled was primarily white. That was a pretty big aha moment for me, being raised in a culture where it was not common or encouraged to talk about race or differences had taught me on some level that these differences were bad. I was truly uncomfortable talking about race or skin color. At that time, I didn't think it was polite or correct to describe Jacko by skin color. It made me uncomfortable. Now I'd love to be able to say that that aha moment inspired me to learn more about racism and how to be anti-racist. However, that was about 20 years ago and that's not exactly what happened. At that time, I still had a belief that loving and being in a relationship with a black person automatically made me not racist. However, spoiler alert, that isn't correct. I've since learned that having proximity to a racialized person doesn't make someone anti-racist. In fact, if anything, it gives you more opportunities to harm that person with racist microaggressions and unconscious behaviors. Gradually, over time, my awareness and understanding of racism has started to shift. I began to understand white supremacy as a system that was in all parts of our society and within each of us. I spent more time with my black family members, my husband and three stepkids and friends. I began reading articles about racism, consuming more media, books, music, news by racialized people. I started to expand my understanding of race and racism. One key learning for me is how harmful being colorblind or not seeing color is. If I talk to a racialized person and communicate to them that I don't see color, that is the same as me telling them that any experience they have had because of their skin color is not real, not important, or not anything that I have an interest in talking about. It erases their experience. It tells them I am not a trusted person that they can talk to. It diminishes their humanity. It's a racist microaggression. Another very important learning that has come to me more recently is that intentions don't matter when you end up causing harm. There's an excellent article written by Jamie Utt on everyday feminism called Intent versus Impact, Why Your Intentions Don't Really Matter. I encourage you to look it up. It's a short and easy read. It connects back to, to not seeing color really well. In this context, what really matters is the impact felt by the racialized person when I say, I don't see color. My intention is good. I'm intending to let the person know that I will not judge or discriminate against them based on their skin color. However, the impact felt is that I'm erasing the racism and discrimination that they have experienced because of their skin color. And the harm or impact is really what is important, not that I'm trying to be a good person. Seven years ago, Jacko and I had a baby, our son in Kony. When I was pregnant, I realized that I, a white woman, was going to be mothering a black child. While I was excited and full of joy and anticipation, I knew that I had to step up and educate myself more so that I would harm my kid less. I started reading books and articles and listening to podcasts. I learned and then later experienced that when my son was very young, being close to my whiteness would likely shield him from some racism. However, as he starts to grow and starts to experience more and more of the world, without me by his side, he will start to experience things that will be invisible to me. Since Nkoni was very young, we've talked about skin color, used it to describe people and characters and stories, to describe our family members and friends. We talk about racism, about Black Lives Matter, how he has the right to correct people when they pronounce his name incorrectly, 
how it is my job also to correct people. We talk about media and notice when all characters in a story are white. We seek out books that are diverse. We do all of this, and yet I know that he's only a few years away from crossing an invisible line to when a lot of people, especially white people, will no longer see him as a child. They will see him as a threat, as dangerous, because of his skin color. When friends see Inco photos of Inconi and say, oh my, he's growing up so quickly, he looks so old, I remind him that he's a child. He loves Lego and Pokemon and cuddles and running fast. This past summer and fall in Toronto, seven nooses were found on five different construction sites. A noose is an extremely strong symbol of brutality, fear, and hatred towards Black people. These nooses were intentionally placed to intimidate and terrorize Black workers. The first nooses that were reported were found at a hospital construction site in my neighborhood. I didn't find out about them in the news. I found out about it from the owner of a local general store called Old School General Store in my neighborhood. Now, as an engineer, I was deeply disturbed to hear about the nooses. As I dug deeper and became involved in a community effort to speak out against these hate crimes, I became even more disturbed about how little I knew about the racism and discrimination that were so prevalent in an industry that I work in. How many projects have I worked on where workers were being harassed or harmed based on their race, gender, or sexuality? Instead of getting stuck in the shame of my ignorance, I'm doing my best to find out what I can do to bring about the change that is needed. Now that I'm aware of some of the problems, I'm doing more to raise awareness, figure out next steps to bring about change. That is a little bit about my journey of learning how to become more anti-racist. We're very fortunate in 2021 to have literally endless resources available to us to help us learn how we can be anti-racist. Reading or listening to books or podcasts is a great start. Two of my favorites so far are So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijiomo Oluo and The Seeing White Podcast by Seen on Radio. It's never too early or too late to begin this journey. Wherever you are is a good place to start. Now we'll have a minute for mission. 
February is Black History Month in Canada. The United Church has recently announced that thanks to mission and service support, six young black adults will begin to collect stories from black church members about their experience in the church, as well as their knowledge of black church history. This fall, there will be a facilitated gathering to share the learnings. The aim isn't so much to identify what we are doing wrong, nor is it about placing blame. It's about hearing the experiences and asking ourselves, where do we go from here? Hopefully it will help create leaders who will help us live into our commitment to become an anti-racist church. Adele Holliday, who spoke last week, is the anti-racism and equity officer for the United Church, and her ministry is supported by Mission and Service. Let us pray the prayers of the people. Most holy and merciful God, be with us in our struggles to be more inclusive, more welcoming, more understanding and wiser in helping others in learning about what it is that they need and give us the energy and strength to do what needs to be done, to take our white privilege apart if necessary, but to take it and use it for good. We are reminded daily of the challenges that the COVID lockdowns are causing people. Within our own church, we have people who are frail and elderly, who are very isolated, who are lonely, who may be sick, who are mourning the loss of a loved one or the loss of contact with loved ones. Help us to be mindful that they need our attention and our time. We are aware of many people in our community who have been affected neg negatively by the lockdowns, who may have lost their jobs, who may have lost their businesses, or whose businesses are failing. Help us to be wise in how we help others. Help us to reach out and touch others. Be with the leaders of our church as we begin another year with a new budget and new plans for our future. Be with the staff as we open up again. It is a challenge for them and we need to be mindful of how we can help and how we can reduce their stress. Amen. Join with me now as we say the prayer of Jesus as printed in the bulletin and written by G. Epp of Edmonton. God who gives birth to the world, who gives us breath, fill us with your light and help us to usher in your reign of love, justice and peace here on earth. Tune us to the harmony of the heavens Teach us to sing your name. Grant us wisdom, hope, and compassion for all living things 
and feed us what we need each day. Free us from what binds us as we release others from guilt and shame. Help us to focus on what is good and to do what is right. Teach us how to love. Renew our hearts, our minds, our strength, and make us whole and wholly yours. Amen. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great family of love throughout the whole wide earth. In him shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden cord close binding humankind. Join hands then, people of the faith, whatever your race may be. All children of a living God are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christ-like souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. When Valerie finished her recording, she asked Jacko if he had anything he wanted to add. And he simply said, Remember that we are all God's children. Amen.